Thank you, team. Well, good morning, church. Good morning, balcony. It's good to see you. Glad that you are here. I want to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. That's on page 974 in your pew Bibles. Uh, for the last couple of weeks, we've been working our way through this series that we've called Family Matters, and we've looked at some important topics like marriage, we've talked about parenting, loss, we've talked about singleness and celibacy, and this week we're going to talk about adoption. Now in each of these cases we've been working uh, a bit of a dual agenda. On the one hand we've been talking about things from a very practical perspective. The Bible is not just a book about how to get saved, it's also a book about how to live as a saved person. And, and that includes of course how to live as part of a family. And so there's a lot of very practical guidance in the Bible about those things, about how to be a husband or a, or a wife, how to be a parent, how to be a child, how to live as a single person, how to deal with loss. All of that is covered for its own sake. And because living wisely in those ways is part of what it means to live as sons and daughters of God. But we've also been using each of these family metaphors uh, to refer back to ultimate issues, the ultimate issue of our relationship with God. Because the most common metaphors that are used in the Bible for our relationship with God are all family metaphors, right? Jesus taught his disciples to pray, our Father, not dear sovereign judge over the cosmos. All the metaphors that are, that are used in the Bible, are, or the majority and certainly the most dear, the most precious metaphors in the Bible that speak about our relationship with God are family metaphors. And so when family matters are talked about in the Bible, there's often a bit of split screen happening. Think for example about the Apostle Paul's teaching on marriage. On the one hand, it's very practical. It shows great insight into human character and nature. He says, husbands, love your wives and wives respect your husbands. That's, that's very wise counsel. That's counsel that shows insight into what makes, makes marriage beautiful and also what makes marriage difficult. It shows insight into the human character, the things that we struggle with. And yet at, all, at the same time, the Apostle Paul uses that discussion to introduce something even more important. He says, for example, in Ephesians 5, he says, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So the Apostle Paul moves from the immediate to the ultimate. He says, I've got some very helpful things to say about the things that you tend to think about the most. You see, family is immediate in the Bible because it's immediate in, in our experience. We tend to think the most about our most intimate human relationships. But family is not ultimate. Remember, remember Jesus said, if you love your mother, your father, your wife, your children more than me, you're not worthy of me. There is a relationship that has to be ultimate. There's a, re a relationship that has to come first because actually until you are in right relationship with God, you'll never be the wife or the husband or the parent or the child that you were meant to be anyway. And so the Bible regularly moves back and forth between immediate and ultimate. And we're going to see that very much today with respect to this conversation about adoption. Adoption is an immediate and urgent issue, particularly in, in this country. I don't know if you know this, but there are hundreds and thousands of children in this country waiting for a forever home. When, uh, when my wife and I were going through our own adoption process, uh, one of the things you had to do is you had to look through the big blue binder of kids that were waiting for a forever home. And that's an absolutely gut-wrenching experience. I, I'm just going to throw something out a little bit. I don't mind if this hits a little hard, because I think Western people sitting in their comfy chairs, living their incredibly comfortable, managed, packaged lives, every once in a while need to be punched in the gut, spiritually speaking, right? We haven't given special instructions to the ushers today, just I'm <laughs> speaking metaphorically. But, I, but I'm saying this, you know, think, think how many couples we have today who have either chosen not to have children or, or who, 
you know, who have chosen to live a very tidy, little, packaged, managed life every year with a special vacation overseas. While there are hundreds and thousands of orphans in this country waiting for someone to take them home. Now, the reason there, you say, well, I thought you had to pay big money. I thought, you know, the reality is there are some children that are, are harder to adopt because they come in sibling sets uh, or because maybe one of them is sick. And there are hundreds and thousands of these children being moved from home to home, institution to institution, waiting for some couple to care about them and take them home. And I remember when we went through that process and we flipped through that binder, it challenges all of your priorities. It's an urgent conversation. It's an urgent issue. And it is used in the Bible, this whole discussion of adoption, this whole theme, it's used to point us towards absolute, ultimate issues with respect to our salvation and God's mercy upon us. So we're going to use Galatians 4, 1 to 7 as a foundation for this conversation. And then we'll, we'll dip into a few other verses in Scripture as we go along. We're going to wrestle with this morning with what this metaphor means, how adoption works, and how this doctrine should affect us as Bible-believing Christians. So hear now the word of the Lord, beginning at verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, it's always important when we're reading a a passage, a a one-off passage like this, to take special note of the context. And the Apostle Paul introduces the, the concept or the metaphor of adoption inside of a larger conversation that he was having with the Galatians about their relationship to the Old Testament law. He's trying to help people understand who they are now as saved people, trusting in the life and in the death and in the resurrection and present intercession of Jesus Christ for their salvation. Who are we now? That's the question, and adoption is part of Paul's answer. Look at verse 7 again. He says, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So Paul is drawing upon a a long tradition within Judaism of understanding redemption and salvation through the lens of adoption. Now, the Apostle Paul did this all the time. In in Romans chapter 9, when he is talking about all the advantages that the Jews had, humanly speaking, uh, with respect to the redemption that we have in Christ, and, and he's talking about all the things that should have helped them understand what it was that God was doing in Christ, he says this. He says, they're Israelites. To them belong the adoption. You see that? He summarizes the, the entire Old Testament system of salvation as the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Paul says, you you guys should have understood this better than anybody because you've, you've you've been through this before. The great Old Testament act of salvation, the Exodus, was an act of adoption. Right? Remember, the Jews were slaves. They were nothing. They were poor. They were pitiful. They were powerless. 
They were the labor force of a superior power, humanly speaking. Nobody cared about them until God claimed them as his own. In Exodus 4.22, God says to Moses, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. See that? Everything changed for Israel in the Bible the moment that God adopted them as his son. The moment God took up their cause as his God, as his cause and said to them, you are my son and if anyone messes with you, they mess with me. That was the moment in the Old Testament when everything changed. Now, don't be put off by all the masculine imagery there. The Bible uses this metaphor and tells some version of this sort of story multiple times, and, and the imagery shifts back and forth from male to female. So, for example, in e Ezekiel chapter 16, God says to the Jewish people, As for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No eye pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you but you were cast out on the open field for you were abhorred on the day that you were born and when I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood I said to you in your blood live I said to you in your blood live I made you flourish like a plant of the field and you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment your breasts were formed your hair had grown yet you were naked and bare so this time God describes his intervention as being like a man who came upon a baby girl abandoned in the field now it was common imagery in those days unfortunately as it remains in some parts of the world today in those days, it was quite common for a baby girl to be killed by exposing her to the elements. For a poor family, uh, they are, their only hope of economic salvation might be the birth of a male child. Baby girls were expensive to, to feed, and they didn't, in those days, in that economy, contribute as much to the bottom line of the family, and so many poor families exposed baby girls to the elements. But God says, I came and I found you. I took compassion on you. I raised you and made you flourish. You became tall and beautiful and I protected you. These are the ways that salvation is described in the Old Testament. And then these metaphors are picked up again in the New Testament. So in the Bible, to speak of our salvation as adoption is to say that we were once helpless, that we were once poor, that we were once naked, we had no covering. We were once powerless and vulnerable until God in Christ had pity on us. We were once slaves until God made us sons and daughters. And, and that's what got Paul talking. That's what got Paul excited in Galatians chapter 4. He is saying to them, you, you're no longer slaves. You once were. You were once entirely subject to elementary forces in the world. You were not free. You were subject to animal lusts and desires and principles and assumptions and worldviews that led you terribly astray, that led you into destructive lifestyles. You were not free. You were making choices, but they were all bad choices. They were all wrong. They didn't help or lead to life because you didn't have the power to do any other and you didn't have opportunity to choose any other. You were slaves. So to speak of our salvation, therefore, as adoption is to speak about rescue. It is to speak about a God who takes pity on us and who lifts us up out of bondage and confusion and perversion and who cleans us up and sets us free and who teaches us slowly but surely over time how to live like sons and daughters of the king. It's a rags to riches story. It's about poor, helpless people being adopted into the richest and most noble family in the world. It's about slaves becoming 
sons and daughters of the king. Now, we used to speak about this all the time. One of the, it's one of the terms that has more or less dropped out of our theological vocabulary. I don't know if you know this, but there's an entire chapter in most or many systematic theology books where the chapter title is adoption. It has its own chapter in many systematic theology books. It used to be one of the main ways we talked about our salvation. It used to be may, one of the main themes of the songs that we sang in the church. Remember the old song, Joint Heirs with Jesus as we travel this saw. Joint Heirs with Jesus. That's adoption language. As we travel this sod, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Do you remember that? We used to sing about that. That's, that's what this metaphor means. Thanks be to God. Now, second question we need to ask is how does adoption work? Specifically, how, does it, how did it work in the ancient world? Most important thing for us to understand is that adoption is a legal concept. It's a legal contract. Generally speaking, a great deal of adoption in the ancient world had to do with the transfer of property and legal rights. So it was, a, it was about passing on assets, estates, titles, and lands. In fact, many adoptions in the ancient world actually involved adult children. It's one of the things we're always surprised when we look back into the original context. Uh, very often, if a, if a rich land-owning titled person had no biological child, uh, then he would usually adopt an heir. He would adopt a son. Usually a nephew or a second cousin or some sort of distant relative would be adopted, brought in closer, and made a son. But there are many, many documented cases of rich, noble Romans adopting slaves and making that slave the legal heir. And the adopted child at that point became the legal child and heir in every single sense of the word. Now, the Bible takes the reality, the binding reality of adoption very, very, very seriously. One of the things that we often forget is that Jesus was adopted. Do you remember that? Jesus was adopted. He was the son of Joseph. He was the son of David because he was adopted by Joseph. You remember that Jesus was not biologically the child of Joseph. The scriptures make that very clear. He was biologically the son of Mary, but Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit. Thus, we call Jesus the son of David because both Matthew and Luke trace his legal right to the throne of David through his adopted family line. Did you ever think about that? That's how seriously the Bible takes adoption. Our entire theology is constructed on this reality. When Jesus was adopted by Joseph, he assumed all of Joseph's legal liabilities, assets, and claims, including his claim on the Davidic throne. All right, so let me break this down for you. Adoption in the biblical sense, means a total merger of legal entities. It means a total merger of legal assets, liabilities, and claims. Thus, when you are adopted by God through faith in Jesus Christ, all of your legal debts are assumed by God. By the way, I don't know if you've ever noticed this. I, I love the version of the Lord's Prayer that we pray here in Canada. It's fine. The reason we pray the version we do is because we all learned it in primary school. If you're my age or older, we used to learn it in primary school. And so we actually learned the version that was in the Anglican Book of Prayer. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. But you've probably noticed that that version is not re reproduced anywhere in the text of Scripture. Have you noticed that? And there's one line that Canadians and Brits say that is, in fact, not very accurate. Uh, Forgive us our what? trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You'll notice that that terminology is not in the Bible. What is the terminology in the Bible? Our American cousins actually get this one right. Bless them. <laughs> what's, what's the American terminology? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That is actually what the Greek text says. 
This is a legal concept. See, when we talk about being adopted in the Scriptures, what we're saying is that we merge with God in terms of all assets, liabilities, and claims. Now, God obviously is infinite in wealth, so He can easily ab absorb our debts. But it's not to say they're not paid for. They're paid for through the death of Christ on the cross because God is both merciful and just. So what happens is when, when it, by the way, this, the Bible makes the same point with another metaphor, with the metaphor of marriage, right? If a, if a poor bride, a bride who had a great deal of debt, married an infinitely rich husband, the moment she married him, all those debts would be absorbed and they would dissolve and she would be the richest woman in the world, right? Debts are absorbed, assets are transferred. That's what happens in a legal marriage contract. That's also what happens in a legal adoption contract. So when you put your faith in Christ, when you repent of your sins and confess of your sins, what happens is what theologians refer to as the great exchange. All your liabilities, all your sin debt, is transferred to Christ's account on the cross and is paid for through his death. Therefore, God doesn't just pretend like you're forgiven. You actually are. It is a real legal transaction. That is why Jesus says on the cross, it is finished. Right? All sin, past, present, and future, was transferring to his account during the hours he was on the cross. When it was all there and all assumed and all paid for, he said, it is finished. That's why the scriptures say, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins. God doesn't just pretend that you are someone else. You are now legally someone else. And the other thing that happens when you put your faith, when you put your faith in the life and death and resurrection of Christ, when you say, his life for mine, let me be found in Christ. Nothing to in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. When you grab onto the cross of Jesus Christ in faith, two things happen. All your debts are assumed by Christ. All his merits are applied to you. That's why the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ really matters. Because God designed the world to release all the blessings of heaven into the realm of humanity through obedience meaning God parents humanity basically the same way you parent your kids. You give them rewards for good, good behavior, punishments for bad behavior. You say, well, that's a great system. The problem is human beings are only capable of bad behavior apart from the grace of God. So what's the solution to that terrible dilemma? God sends an obedient son to do for us what we could never do for ourselves and to pay for what we have done in his body on the cross. And that's why the cross is now the gateway into the Father's presence. It's the great exchange. All your debts assumed by God and paid by Christ. All God's assets shared now with all those who have faith in Christ. That's how adoption works. God assumes your liabilities and you inherit his assets. And that's why this metaphor is so beloved in the Bible. It is the gospel, the gospel in miniature. And that leads to our third question. How should this doctrine affect us? The doctrines that are in the Bible are not there simply to be analyzed and appreciated. They are there to be experienced and enjoyed. God wants you to do more this morning than believe that you can be adopted into his family through Christ. He wants you to experience and delight in adoption. That's why Paul says in Galatians 4, he says, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You see that? God wants you to do more than believe this. God wants you to feel this. Can I tell you something, North American conservative evangelical friends? One of the things we do is we often overreact to excesses and abuses. In, in the 70s and 80s, Christianity got a little touchy-feely there, didn't it? Right? People weren't just raising one hand like reasonable people. They were raising both hands, and they were jumping up and down, and sometimes they were crying, and that was just too much, wasn't it? Right? Too much for certainly us 
you know, Canadians with our respectable British heritage or European heritage, right? We don't want to get all that excited, rolling around and getting, jumping up and down, crying. That's, that's not for us. And, and so we have overemphasized doctrine over experience. Now, let, let's just be very clear. We, in the Bible, we start with truth. Absolutely. But the whole point of truth is it's supposed to change and affect experience. What's the point of believing something if it doesn't change how you feel? And so here, isn't it interesting that job one, job one of the Holy Spirit when he comes into the heart of a new believer is to make you feel like you belong. Isn't that interesting? God cares how you feel. I love how the Apostle Paul puts this in Ephesians 1. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. Paul says there's some stuff you need to know in order to praise God right. He says, let's start here. You need to know God loved you, that He chose you from before the foundation of the world to be His children in holiness before Him forever. That was the purpose of God's will. You need to understand something, friends. God wants you here. God wants you here. Now, I don't know how you actually got here, but I know that God wants you here. God chose you, the Scriptures say. If you belong to God, if you have faith in Him through Christ, if you've been reconciled to God through Christ, here's something you should understand. God chose you. I know it feels like you chose Him. All of us look back to that moment where we chose Him, right? You've heard me talk about, I remember that moment. You probably have a moment that you remember. And we're all tempted to begin our spiritual story there and say, that's where it all began for me. And what Paul says, listen, you'll praise God better if you understand that's actually not where it began for you. Before you chose Him, God chose you from before the foundation of the world. That is to say, before you had done anything, good or bad, God loved you. How about that? That'll make you praise Him better. That'll make you feel like you belong. It ought to. Don't you ever doubt that. You know, one of the fears that you have when you adopt children, you worry about whether you will love them as much as you love your biological children. And even more, you worry about whether they will be any less secure in your love than your biological children. I wondered about that. Some of you may, you may know our story a little bit. My wife and I fostered 16 different children over about a nine-year stretch. It made our house a pretty busy place. At one point, we had um, five children under the age of seven in the house. And sometimes they weren't the same seven. Uh, like, I would go to work sometimes in the morning and come home and some kids are gone and some new kids are there and I was like, what happened? This is before cell phones. <laughs> True story. I, I would, you know, yeah, it was strange occurrences were aplenty in our house. And we would, we would have a combination of biological children and foster children. At one point, we had two biologicals, three foster children in the home. Our adopted daughter, Michaela, was the youngest of those five children. She came to us as a baby, and we were told that we would only have her for, for six months. And we were happy to have her in our home. Part of our family mission was to extend the benefits and the blessing of family to those who did not have it and who might never have it. Most of the kids that we had in our home were only with us for a short time. We had some kids that were with us for a couple weeks, uh, and then we had other kids that were with us for three years. We never really knew. We were usually waiting to see how things would shake out in the courts. Uh, oftentimes, biological parents would need a little bit of time to get their affairs in order, or there would be a 
a search for another relative who could come forward and provide for the child. In Michaela's situation, we were told that she would be with us for about six months. And when she had been with us for about 18 months, uh, we were told that she would be put up for adoption. And of course, by this point, we had fallen completely in love with her. And uh, the thought of being parted from her was absolutely horrific. I remember trying to make a, a goodbye video to her that she'd be able to watch when she grew up. And I couldn't get through it then, and I, I certainly can't get through it even thinking about it now. It was just a horrific thing to think about. And uh, we were told that we, we could apply if we wanted to, to adopt her. But we were also told that the preference of the adoption board was always to place children with their same colored family. And as you probably noticed, my wife and I are unhelpfully white. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, we decided we would pray about it and we would go for it. Now, we didn't know how we would afford it, uh, but we just felt like this was something that the Lord uh, wanted us to do. So we just decided we're going to go for it. And the very next day at church, a f family came up to us and said, out of nowhere, we hadn't said this to anybody, but they said, if you're thinking about adopting that little girl that you have in your home, we would pay for it. And we took that as pretty solid confirmation. And so we went ahead with the process. 18 months uh, later, we signed the paperwork, and she was legally ours in every sense of the word. And I remember that it meant so much to me, just that she was ours, because always throughout the process, through that 18 months, I was worried someone was going to come and take her. I'm going to drink some water. I remember when we first got the paperwork that she was ours, it came with a form from the government saying if we wanted to apply uh, for some educational assistance money later on that was available to adopt children, we could do so. And I got rid of that piece of paper because I didn't want to have any further contact with the government. I just, I didn't want them to ever talk to us again. <laughs> I didn't care for the money. Just forget that we exist and go away and never come back. <laughs> But I remember one day thinking about whether I felt any different about her than I did about my other children. I wanted to know. And so I looked into myself and I did an inventory of my feelings and I discovered beyond a shadow of a doubt that there wasn't an ounce of difference in my heart. I just didn't care whether it was this womb, that womb, or a test tube. It didn't matter to me. She was mine in my heart and my mind because... <laughs> this was a bad idea. <sighs> we were going to talk about divorce this morning, but I changed the order <laughs> of topics because it's Thanksgiving, and I didn't think that would make people feel thankful. <laughs> this seemed like a good idea at the time. Anyway, I knew that she was ours because God had given her to us. <clears throat> but I was mostly worried about how she would feel. And I, I never wanted her to doubt her place. Now, the government, those people, the adoption people, they tell you that you're supposed to tell your adopted child that they're adopted around the age of six. I don't know how they figure this stuff out, but that's what they said. And so when she was approaching her, her sixth birthday, we decided we we're going to do this. And so we went, we, we went out to her favorite restaurant, which was Swiss Chalet. Always thankful that she has cheap taste. <laughs> very, very thankful. Anyway, so we went out to Swiss Chalet, and we got her lots of fries and dip or sauce or whatever, and I figured we'll wait till she's a full sauce in, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so then I, I brought up the topic, and I had been sick 
for the previous week. Had no idea how it would go and was just feeling horrible about the whole thing. Explained everything. And then I said, now, do you have any questions? And she said, can I have more sauce? <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> Let's never speak about this ever again. You can have all the sauce you like. But we did, we, they do say you should, you should talk about it again when they, when they sort of get to their teenage years. So we had, we had the talk uh, again. And, and I said to her, you know, you, above all my children, should know that you're not an accident. Some of my kids actually are accidents. <laughs> Right? That's okay. They're downstairers. <laughs> but I said, you, you above all should know that you're not an accident. God put you here. And we fought for you. And so you should always know you're not here just because of the desires of an earthly father. You're here because of the choice of a heavenly father and the will of an earthly father. And you can rest in that. And I wanted to rest in that because, here's the thing, feelings matter. You know? It's not enough to believe this stuff. You have to know it, and you have to feel it. And that's what the Holy Spirit does in the heart of a saved person. Slowly but surely, it makes you feel like who you are. He pushes your feelings in the direction of the facts. And that is so important. It matters who you are. It matters what is true. And it matters how you feel about what is true. And God gives us the Holy Spirit to help us in that very thing. Thanks be to God. Second way this doctrine should affect us is by making us feel grateful. You can't pay God back for His grace. Right? A couple reasons for that. Number one, He doesn't need anything. And number two, you don't have anything that He didn't give you. It's just like as a kid, you can't pay back your parents with the allowance that they gave you. It doesn't work that way. You can't earn your salvation, and you can't pay God back. So the only response that you can make is gratitude. In the Bible, God says, the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. See that? Just say thank you. That's all you need to do. Just receive what God has done in Christ for your salvation. Receive His life as your life. Receive His death as the payment, the death that you owe a holy God. Receive His resurrection as confirmation that your payment has been received in full. Receive His intercession as your welcome now into the presence of the Father. Receive all that and say thank you. Thank you is the essence of Christian living, right? And I, I know that there was a generation that knew this. I'm not sure if we know this anymore. But thank you literally is the essence of Christian living. Many of you know our communion table today is covered up with Thanksgiving stuff, and that's great. I'm not offended by that at all. I think that's awesome, just to be clear. But when we put everything on the communion table, when we put the bread and the cup, it, I hope you know, is just as much prepared for Thanksgiving. The other name for communion, we usually refer to communion as the Lord's Supper. That's totally appropriate. That's one of the main names. But you remember in your grandparents' day, you probably called it the Eucharist. And there's lots of folks who'd still use that language. It's a Greek word. Eucharist literally means the Thanksgiving. Did you know that? And so maybe, you know, because not too many people speak Greek anymore, and I get that, but maybe we should just call this table the Thanksgiving table, because that's what it is, not just this Sunday. Every Sunday of the year, this is the Thanksgiving table. 
This is when we remember what God has done in Christ to secure our salvation. That's what communion is. It is us receiving what God has done in faith and saying, thank you. Thank you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thirdly, understanding this metaphor and this great salvation that we have should make us feel noble. Paul talks about that in Ephesians in chapter 4. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I urge you to walk worthily. The entirety of Christian ethics can be summed up in one line. Live like who you are. You are sons and daughters of the King. Live like that. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. You have been called out of the darkness, out of slavery, into His marvelous light. Live like that. Live with nobility. Live like children of the King. Don't wallow in the muck like a slave. Stand on your feet like a son or a daughter of the King. Sanctification is just one of those big fancy words that we use. What it really means is slowly but surely becoming who you are. As Christians, we are sons and daughters, brothers and sisters of Christ, sons and daughters of the King, right now. At the moment you become a Christian, you are that now. And yet, it takes us a while to behave like who we are. And so, the Scriptures talk about sanctification in a progressive sense. Paul says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So here's the second job of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, once, when the Holy Spirit comes in you, right, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Right away, immediately, you are free. You are changed. You're a different person. But then slowly but surely over time, the Holy Spirit teaches you to behave like who you are. He changes you by one degree of glory into the same image. That is the image of Christ. So all the adopted children of God are learning how to behave by watching the only begotten Son of God so that slowly but surely we become who we are. Men and women sons and daughters created and called in the image and likeness of God. Understanding the doctrine of adoption should make you want to live and walk like who you are. Lastly, this doctrine should also make us feel generous. When you understand what you've been given, you want to share that generously with other people. In fact, the whole Christian life comes down to living like who you are and giving as you have received. Jesus said this to his disciples, freely ye have received, freely give. You remember we used to sing that one too? A lot of good theology in those songs. When you think about who you are, and how God has saved you, and what God has made you a part of, then you want to turn around and give that freely to other people. In fact, Jesus said that if you don't want to do that, if that connection is never made, then it actually calls into question whether you have truly received the grace of God in the first place. That's the punchline, you remember, of the parable of the unforgiving servant? The king says to the man on whom he had shown mercy, he says, should not you have had mercy? on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Shouldn't you treat other people the way I have treated you? That's what your Christian faith is supposed to do to you. It's supposed to make you want to treat other people like God in Christ has treated you. 
And that takes us back to where we started this morning. In Galatians 4, Paul has been trying to explain to Christians their new relationship with the law. By the way, isn't that the hardest thing to figure out? Some, some Christians think, well, now that I'm a Christian, I can do whatever I want, right? Because God's forgiven me. Now I can li- live like an absolute, you know, pagan and, and slave, and, and I can get down in the mud and roll around because I'm forgiven. Which, of course, is to completely forget the fact that all, in, 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 in the mystery of eternity, that all those things you're doing now are being added to Christ on the cross. And it's to forget who you are. And so, and so we, that's not what we want. But neither is it to think that we can somehow pay God back with acts of obedience. No, 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 no. That's not what this is about. What Paul says to these people, you understand this, your relationship with the law now is, is different. When, when you, before you knew any better, when you were a slave to all your lusts and passions, God gave you the law as a gift. It was like an electric fence that was trying to keep you from running headlong into stupid. It's a gift. All the commandments are for your good, right? Do, do not commit murder. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. Try to build a community where people disregard those basic facts. This is for your good. This is going to help you get along. This is going to help you live a healthy, long, prosperous, happy life. The law was a gift. But Paul says, you understand this, it also kept you in a type of slavery because it forced you to do what you didn't want to do. He says, but now that you're a Christian, now that you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you've outgrown the law. We can turn the electricity off of that fence now because you don't need it. You now, filled with the Holy Spirit, increasingly want to do the right thing. You want to honor God. You want to live like who you are. You want to love others as God in Christ has loved you. So you don't need the law anymore. You're not a slave. You're not a child. You're an heir. You don't threaten heirs. Heirs do what they do because of what's been done to them. They love the Father. They remember what He did. And they're thankful. That's the Christian life in a nutshell. And no one put it more succinctly than James, the brother of Jesus. He said this. Here it is right here. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. There it is right there, isn't it? You don't need the law anymore. Just remember this. You are a child of your father. So keep yourself unstained by the world. Don't roll around in the mud. Live like who you are. Child of the king. And love others as God in Christ has loved you. He wrapped you in. Now you go and wrap some other people into your family. He had some mercy on you before you deserved it. Now you go and have some mercy on other people who don't deserve it. He went looking for you. He found you when nobody else wanted you. Now you go and you look for some people and you find them and you have mercy on them and you wrap them in and you make sure they know that they belong. Now, it won't necessarily always mean formal legal adoption in every case, but I'll tell you this, it better mean something. Don't go home with warm, fuzzy feelings only. Go home and analyze to what extent you love others the way God in Christ has loved. You don't get to change the definition. God loved you in a very concrete way. Now, you go and love some people in a very concrete way. Now, maybe it, mean, maybe it doesn't mean wrapping children into your home. James gives us options. He says, there are lots of vulnerable people in the world. There are children, and there are old people. If your life doesn't work for children, wrap in some older folks, right? There's options here. But I'll tell you this. 
You'll have to look long and hard, and I think you'll have to look way beyond the pages of the Bible to justify the self-indulgent lives that so many young people are living today. God didn't save you and make you who you are so you could go on multiple vacations. God didn't give you all the extra capacity He gave you just so that you could spoil one or two kids absolutely rotten. There's got to be more there. Maybe, maybe you could foster. Maybe you could adopt. Maybe you could support other families who are thinking of doing the same. Can I tell you that? My life was changed by that family who came to me on that Sunday morning. Maybe you can be that miracle in somebody else's life. All I know is this. You better live like who you are. That's the imperative in the text. And you better love others. We all better the way God and Christ has loved us. We want to have mercy on widows and orphans. We want to keep ourselves unstained by the world. We want to visit the old in their homes. We want to bring the young into our homes. This is right religion. This is how you live as a son or daughter of your father. Because this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we have so much to be thankful for. We are thankful for all your blessings to us in Christ. We're thankful that you had mercy on us. That before we'd done anything, good or bad, before the foundation of the world, you knew us, you loved us, you put your call on us. And then at the right time, you opened our ears, you opened our eyes, you softened our hearts, you helped us to receive and believe in the implanted and saving word. You came for us. You strengthened our heart and our hands to take hold of Christ in faith. You filled us with your spirit. You taught us how to address you as Father, and you are changing us by one degree of glory into the next into the same image as your precious only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, by whom we have been saved, by whom we have been changed, and in whose name we give you thanks today. Amen.